we're live everyone thank you so much for uh tuning in guys tonight to today's live stream i'm with uh raw matt from over in the channel standing for truth raw matt how are you doing just saw the uh image you threw up <laughs> i like it there you go i wish uh, i could find a bit huh i'm doing pretty good all right well i wish i could put a big a better picture of you up there but that's pretty much the best picture there is out there of you um Okay, whatever. We're going to deal with it. Uh, so, uh, Ramat, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the flood because most people to this very day have a tendency to think that the flood is pretty much has the least amount of evidence going for it, when in reality it's one of the strongest models. When I was uh, first getting into this, geology was something that I was like, oh man, that's, that's going to be pretty tough because I know a lot about rocks in general. You know, all the different compositions that they make up and how to cut them. My friend Jacob Hopkins runs Sculpture Stone. And what you do is uh, you go out and you pick a rock and you bring it to them. And we design it and we shape it for you. Anything. And uh, we're used to cutting them. We use diamond tip saws. We cut through granite. It takes all day to actually cut a piece of granite rock in half with a diamond tip saw. So when we're getting into the flood, we're like, wow, a lot of the flood has to do with granite and limestone. So I was like, I guess I could learn about this. This is will be right up my alley. So I started investigating it, and sure enough, the flood has so much evidence going for it now. It's unbelievable. Matter of fact, I like when people bring up the argument now, because <laughs> there's just too much evidence. It's great. And you've seen, I've made probably 10 videos specifically on the flood, and they're hours long, some of them. Yeah, I, I definitely enjoy uh, learning about geology and paleontology and all the, all the, the whole nine yards and everything like that. Uh, so, Brother Matt, uh, Really quickly, uh, a lot of people have been asking this question. What does uh, the Ice Age have to do with Noah's Flood? I guess that would be a nice starter question for the stream. Uh, yeah, a lot of people think the Ice Age ended 10,000 years ago in their in the secular model. And it was brought on like another wave was, meaning it's been one of multiple Ice Ages. And this is when the mastodons started to roam the earth. This is when the whole earth itself was extremely cold. At the equator, it was pretty much the only place not really covered in ice. And as soon as you started to really get up north, by the time you even reached California, the ice was the oil, supposedly already there. And the continents were already divided. But in the global flood model, the continent was together like in a form of Pangaea. And then it was ripped apart during the flood at where we can look down and see what's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Now what happened is when that Fountains of the Great Deep broke forth, it brought with it massive amounts of ice because what happened is when the water shot up into the upper atmosphere, it reached high up into the atmosphere where it got extremely cold and it froze and it fell back to Earth. And the reason it fell back extremely heavy is because it had sediments with it. See, rain only falls to Earth because it's water, right? It only falls to earth if there's something for water to attach to it, even today. So for rain to come down, every raindrop in it has either a piece of bacteria or a piece of sand or dust in it. That's what allows it to fall back to earth. But back then there was such a heavy amount of water in the upper atmosphere that it was freezing and it had all these sediments in it. So it was landing in lakes and rivers and it was instantly freezing them. And that's what brought on the ice age that we have. All right. so. Uh... Yeah, I was going through a little bit of your book while you were talking here, uh, showing the folks uh, what you've written about this. And uh, I'm pretty sure you were touching a little bit about this, but based... Uh, so when the Fountains of the Great Deep broke open, uh, first before we talk and get into that a little, uh, what do you think about the canopy theory? Because a lot of people have been saying like it's, it's not really actually <clears throat> scientifically based. Do you think that there's uh, uh, evidence... For a canopy of ice being over the earth or at all oh yeah of course uh, we don't have to look up and see the canopy to know that it existed because we have the atmospheric conditions of the past already written in stone what i mean by that is when we look at amber we can see that the oxygen was twice the amount of pressure that it was today so the oxygen was stronger there was more magnetism and what would really cause the atmosphere to be twice as saturated in oxygen back then as it was today well the canopy is what answers that question better than anything else. See, nothing in the Young Earth creation model besides a canopy can account for 
4,500 years ago, they're being in a totally different thing. How can we account for a lifespan being extremely high without blocking the damaging radiations from the sun? The canopy answers that. It refracts radiation that would be coming in and damaging the human body. Most of the mutations that occur today in the human body occur because of radiation that comes from the sun. That's what causes skin cancer, for example. So we can't have people living for 900 years if the very sun itself is causing them damage. It was part of the pre-flood world. It's what helped us all and allowed us to live an extremely long time. And it's why right after the flood, there's no more canopy, and you can see the lifespans diminishing quickly. So uh, this is a lot of information, for, especially for those who are literally just getting into this. But uh, basically, uh, uh, just to summarize what Raw Matt said is that we see in the fossil record, uh, we see, well, also another evidence for the canopy theory is that we see uh, evidence in the fossil record, we see hu much larger animals, so I'm pretty sure you know about this, Brother Matt, uh, Brother Matt but uh, larger animals than they are today. For example, um, uh, the large uh, megalodon. Uh, megalodon was, a, all of you probably know what it is, it's like a shark. Uh, it's a shark. Uh, that uh, uh, appeared to be uh, to look like a, a, a great white shark, but it, except it's over 60 feet long. How did it get that big? Uh, there were huge uh, dragonflies in the, I believe it was in the Carboniferous period, and the geologic era, uh, and the geologic uh, time scale. Uh, so we see larger animals back then than they are today. Uh, why is that? Ramad explained. Well. Uh, Dr. Carl Baugh in the Creation Evidence Museum. I went to go look at, uh, went to go visit the Creation Evidence Museum some time ago. Um, he has this. Uh, you, if you want to, you can talk about this too, uh, Ramat. Uh, he has this uh, huge. Uh, what what did he build? I forget what it's called. It's called a hyperbaric, hyperbaric bio. Yeah, the hyperbaric bio chamber, and uh, he he has done many experiments of what the atmosphere uh, was like prior to the flood, prior to El Diluvio, the Diluvian, the anti-Diluvian world. And so uh, uh, he's done many experience, uh, experiments, and he has found that animals get uh, end up living longer, have, have a longer expect, uh, life expectancy in that chamber uh, than outside of it because of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the oxygen levels in there. So if you want, you can talk about that a little bit, Ramat, because you're obviously more knowledgeable about that than I am, but go ahead. Uh, sure, yeah. The the interesting thing is is that the firmament did impact the pressure, the pressurized oxygen. So it didn't only just create more oxygen, it created more pressure. Otherwise, we could just jump on an oxygen machine today and live longer from it. But that's not the case. Matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why a lot of dinosaurs couldn't live in the very world that we live in today, because of the fact that they needed to breathe and, uh, and their nostrils and their, their ca lung capacity wouldn't allow them to survive on the earth that we're on today because we have half the amount of oxygen as where insects they survived like he was mentioning giant dragonflies things like that the reason they live is because they breathe through their skin and a, a dinosaur would not be able to they relied on their nostrils to breathe so a brontosaurus would never be able to survive in the atmosphere today simply based on its size they couldn't absorb that a perfect example is a sloth because today you can pick one up and they weigh no more than 30 pounds they're little tiny things but back then they were six thousand pounds they didn't have to climb a tree. They could reach the top of the tree without ever climbing it. They could walk right past lions, tigers. It didn't matter. Everything was wouldn't even touch it. They were scared to death of them. Even though they probably were extremely slow moving like they are today, it didn't matter. Their lifespan was extremely long. And we believe that humans were no exception to that. Humans lived extremely long periods of time because the atmosphere from the ice canopy allowed it to happen naturally. So just naturally, people could live in that environment much longer just from that alone. Right, right. So let's let's get into like some of the geology since this is sort of going uh, farther from geology as we talk about this. But uh, uh, let's talk about geology a little bit, brother. Uh, if if the Noah's flood was true, what would we expect to find? Uh, we would expect to find little or no erosion uh, uh, between layers, and uh, uh, we barely find any erosion between layers, especially if you go to the Grand Canyon or any. Uh, 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 a geologic uh, area, and you see through the layers, there's barely any erosion. You don't find animal holes. You don't find uh, uh, V-shaped erosion marks, which would be expected to be found if these 
uh, if these uh, layers are centuries apart. Now, I know what they'll say. They're not centuries apart. They're just from different floods. Uh, that's uh, uniformitarianism. Uh, well, here's the thing. Don't you think it'd rain every once in a while between those floods? Or, at, I mean, even wind can cause erosion. Anything can cause erosion. I mean, just even the the, the, the shaking of the earth uh, uh, or uh, from a dinosaur, from a large dinosaur, could cause erosion. I mean, uh, talk about that a little, Rob, Matt. Uh, the fact that we find very little erosion or no erosion at all. And talk about what someone brought up in a debate with Nephilim Free. Uh, uh, erosion cannot take place above the, uh, or below, excuse me, the sea level, something like that. You want to, you want to talk about that? You know what I'm sure. talking about? Yeah, yeah, okay. no problem. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, it, it's kind of like we'll, we'll hit it at the same time. We'll hit it twice. Now, depending, most of the seafloor uh, does have life on it, but there are a lot of places where it's sand. And so lots of sand today means that there won't be much ability for plants and the organisms to grow. Because remember, once you get down to a certain depth, there's not much life. The deeper you go, that's the difference between an ocean and a sea is, is level. Sea means it's pretty shallow or ocean is extremely deep. That's the only difference between the two. And the deep parts of the ocean, you don't get a lot of life. So the best way for us to determine what are actual layers would be like you said, us to determine, were they actually forced? Were these actually eons of time that have been passing? And we say no. And the reason why we say no is because of something called bioturbation. And what that means is these are living organisms that burrow in the ground and then come back out again. Picture worms diving up and down. Now, if you have worms in an aquarium and you leave them in there for about 30 days, you can watch a lot of bioturbation happening. But when we look at these massive amounts of layers, in these rocks, we don't see any bioturbation. So we would expect, obviously, if these were actually forests that have been alive for thousands or millions of years, we would see tons of evidence of bioturbation, and we just don't see that. Matter of fact, there's a place called Specimen Ridge at Yellowstone National Park, and it has 27 layers. And now they've counted, and they've actually found over 50 recently. But did you know each layer contains the remains of multiple mature forests and petrified trees going down multiple layers, trees that have over a thousand different rings, but yet no animal fossils have ever been discovered there since the article was written about in 1986. It means no animals, birds, insects, or worms, but yet trees are everywhere. So how could that be that only exists because of Noah's flood? There is no way secular science can account for there being no life but all these different layers. Now, talk. Uh, there's something similar to that, actually, and if you you covered it in one of your videos, uh, if you look at the geologic record, you see all these huge animals. You see like these huge sauropods, like the Barosaurus, the Plodocus, and the and the uh, the geologic uh, t uh, record. Um, but you barely see any plants, and each of those animals would take hundreds of pounds of plants intake every single day because they needed to grow about like 10 pounds every single month or yeah. week, excuse me, every single week. Yeah. And yet we see virtually no plants with these huge sauropods. Why? Why? And how would the flood explain that? Well, good question again. And as a matter of fact, this is a great question because the answer falsifies evolution yet again and proves our model. Because first of all, our model says that the world was a tropical paradise. And that's all we find everywhere, even in the frozen tundras. Everything's been frozen. And you can see it's subtropical everywhere. Even the mammoths, every time they find a mammoth and they find food that's around it, the mammoth was surrounded by tropical food, not from the ice. So the, the mammoths weren't walking around in an ice age. They existed before that as well, kind of like camels. You think of a camel only existing in the sand. No, they found camels up in Russia surrounded by tropical forests. But here's the thing. Grass in the theory of evolution didn't evolve until 55 million years ago. Well, when did dinosaurs go extinct? 65 million years ago. So they said dinosaurs never saw grass. Well, guess what? When they've found and they've investigated and they found they found more dinosaur crap than they actually have dinosaurs when they study fossilized dinosaur dung. Guess what? Almost all of it, especially from sauropods, is covered in grass, meaning that's what they ate. Their majority of diet was grass. So they said grass didn't they didn't even see grass, let alone eat it. Now we find that the theory completely is wrong, and they ate grass constantly. And that's exactly the opposite of what evolution said. 
So I love right. that. Right, I heard that argument as well. Uh, and I think it just absolutely falsifies at least that part of evolution because if you have grass evolving 20, uh, 20 million years ago, then how do we have grass in these coprolites, uh, coprolites, uh, however you want to call it, coprolites, uh, dino, uh, fossilized dung? Uh, how are you going to find this grass in these coprolites? You, uh, and these dinosaur coprolites, especially sauropods, they found uh, grass uh, and coprolites in China and Asia and uh, sauropods from Asia. And so that, that absolutely falsifies that part of evolution. Now, there's something else interesting that I found uh, while researching uh, uh, paleontology and all that, um, when we look at the the fossil record, we see that sauropods were at the top of their game in the Jurassic period. We see all this massive diversity in the Jurassic period. We see se uh, several different sauropods. We have Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, uh, Barosaurus. We have uh, Camarasaurus, Camarasaurus, excuse me, uh, Apatosaurus. We have all these diverse uh, sauropods, but then you cross that layer from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous, and you only find a handful of sauropods, almost as if the pre-existing diversity had all just narrowed down so much that a small population just slowly repopulated it, and then shortly went extinct right after. Um, what do you think about that, Ramat? What, uh, uh, how, how would that fit into the flood? I think that would fit in extremely well with the flood because of whatever Noah decided to bring on the ark would have been just two of their own kind. So he would have not brought multiple species of different types of animals on the ark. So, for example, let's pretend that there's multiple varieties of sloths. Today we only have one. It's just a sloth. There's no other new species, right? So Noah would have brought one on the ark and it would have diversified. The same thing with a wolf. And then we have dogs from them. So there's multiple varieties and different species of dogs and wolves, right? So the same thing would have happened with the dinosaur. If he would have brought on w one variety, then they would have narrowed down in the bottleneck. And then the flood would have happened. And then whatever Noah brought, they would have gone out and they would have speciated. They would have grown a little while. They would have done well in our atmosphere and they would have died. That's one scenario. Another one is that when the continents of the Great Deep broke apart, and it's ripping land masses apart. Some of them are going to be caught off in certain areas, just like certain species of animals today only live in certain places. So if Australia today got riddled with a disastrous flood and everything got destroyed, well, guess what? We wouldn't have koalas anymore. We wouldn't have kangaroos anymore. We wouldn't have a lot of marsupials anymore that are only native to that land. So the same thing would have happened in the Noah's flood because the diversity of the continents would have ripping apart, would have spread creatures apart and diversified them and moved them apart. So we would see them on different continents today when in reality they would have actually all been together and spread apart of a massive single continent before. Right, and and that leads me to the next question. Where do you think the flood boundary is? I know that Dr. Marcus Ross, uh, a paleontologist that I'll be interviewing uh, next week on Thursday, um, he believes that the uh, the flood boundary is at the end of the Mesozoic and the Cretaceous period. You know, that split between the Mesozoic to the Cenozoic, I believe. <clears throat> and he believes that's where the flood boundary is. Uh, everything above the Mesozoic is post-flood. Um, where do you think uh, the, the flood boundary falls in? Well, everything above the Great Unconformity is actually... A jumbled mess. And the reason we find that is because that's what floods do. Did you know if you go to uh, Alaska uh, or Antarctica and you want to go looking for dinosaur bones, do you know what they do? They just get out of their boat and they look. They don't dig anywhere. That's because they can find dinosaur bones sticking out of the ground. So there's some places on Earth where there's massive flood layers, and there's some where they've actually been so compressed and so much weight was on top of them, they turned into oil. And then there's some places like the Ashley phosphate bed where there were so many of them pressed into one area that they actually turned into the phosphate itself. So we're, we're looking around and we're seeing dinosaur graveyards. We're seeing oil. We're seeing petrified forest. I don't even know what, what to say if there's a single flood layer. Everywhere I look, I see remnants of a flood, but I can't determine where there's a flood layer because so many layers are remnants of the flood. It's scattered everywhere. You can dig down deep and find layers of the flood, and you can stay on the top and you see layers of the flood. So it just depends on where on earth you are. It's amazing. All right, so would, that, would the verse that says, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, would that sort of play into that? 
Oh, uh, it could be, yeah, because if you think about like what the great unconformity is, it's like the original piece of land, right? And then and then things built on top of that. And then during the flood, when the granite underneath the continents was being compressed and being crushed by the weight of the continent from above it, and it's in creating all this supercritical water and creating new elements, and it was ejecting tons of this decay. Limestone was shooting everywhere on Earth, the, the bits of it. That's why we see all these different layers of limestone everywhere. And we, on one of the top layers is actually limestone. And the secular camp says that limestone was formed over living coral over millions and millions of years. So they need that to happen. The only problem with that theory is limestone can't be made unless it's under perfect conditions. Now, I'll tell you, this is how limestone is made. They believe that coral takes in ocean water and they emit calcium from it. And that's how uh, limestone is actually made. The only problem with that theory is it has to be in extremely shallow water. And as it's making it, the ground below it has to be moving out to water slowly because if it does it quick, it dies. If it doesn't do it at all, it dies. So the conditions need to be absolutely perfect for calcium like that to be made, to make limestone. So they have a huge problem with that. And we, we look and we see limestone and they say, oh, it's millions of years old. There's no way to date limestone. So they're just making it up. Right, right. So uh, this is a question that I've been mulling over for a while. Um, when were the uh, the Grand Canyon rocks made? Uh, the rocks themselves. See, this is what I this is what I've been mulling over. See, if the Grand Canyon rocks themselves formed during the flood, which is probably what you think, right? Then how did the canyon itself get formed? Did it also get formed during the flood or post flood, or is that just or or did the rocks themselves where did they just exist prior to the flood? Good question. We have to look at the, what the layers are actually made of. And uh, there's a part in the book that I added. It's probably around page 47. And you can see the different layers. And I'll explain it there while you look it up. But here's my theory on that. I don't think the Grand Canyon is where the fountains of the Great Deep broke forth. And the reason why is because the Grand Canyon was never out in the middle of the ocean. It's inland. That actually is part of the rupture that we see caused by the ripping and the continents being torn apart, but it's not where the water came out. Now, the interesting thing is if the Grand Canyon was evidence that the Colorado River carved it, there would need to be hundreds of metric tons of rock downstream from that in the delta, and it's not there. Where is all the rock that was used to carve that basin? There, it's not there. So the flood ripped through that and removed that rock away, but it's not where the water came out from. It was just ripped apart and then water flowed through it. But you can see the different layers of limestone there. Limestone formed during the flood and about six of them or seven of them are actually limestone. Now, as I told you, limestone was created during the flood, during supercritical water pulling elements out of the ground and then ejected during the time of the flood. So as the flood waters spread over the face of the earth, it was deposited, and they think that they these are different layers for eons of time. And I've just described to you the scenario that's required for limestone to form, so it's all hypothetical. It's all ad hoc explanation. Right, it's like the abiogenesis thing, and, you know... Yeah, I'm trying to get Anthony on uh, sometime, but he doesn't have Skype, he doesn't have... Uh anything so i'm trying to find out how to like uh get him on through Streamyard. i don't have chrome on this computer and so uh and like i told you earlier the storage is pretty much loaded and so i yeah i can't really fit anything well, else onto it no nah, just do what kent does and call him up on the phone and put him on speakerphone yeah I, i've been thinking about that yeah uh yeah I, I'll, I'll have to uh see how to like make the audio louder <laughs> This video is about how ancient fossilized trackways prove Noah's flood to be true. You see, fossil footprints are a common thing when we look at the rock layers. However, there are major discrepancies in these tracks which can help us easily falsify evolution and help us prove the biblical flood occurred. Trackways consistently appear in rock layers below the remains and teeth and shells and skeletons of the animals that made them. 
If you think that the Earth is billions of years old, then layers of rock are supposed to be representing millions of years of history. How is it possible then that so many footprints? How could millions of years pass with millions of creatures dying and none of them leaving a trace of their existence behind besides their footprints? Here is that solution. The global flood easily accounts for them finding trackways below body fossils because those creatures that made their trackways either fled to higher ground to survive or were lifted up and carried higher. Their bones and teeth and shells eventually being buried by the rising flood water. As a result, their body fossils would be found consistently higher than their trackways. And this is exactly what we see. We see the less mobile aquatic life buried by rising mud and sediments brought in by the tsunamis with larger and mobile creatures at the top not because they evolved that way, and this pattern we see everywhere worldwide. It's a pattern found in trilobites, amphibians, and dinosaurs alike. Even according to the older paradigm, tracks are being found millions of years before body fossils and are just considered a curiosity. Posits are visible. He was looking for trilobites in just one of the lower areas, and so he got down on his hands and knees to investigate but he found only a handful of animal burrows or pipes. These are made by organisms that once burrowed into the ocean floor. He noticed that the trilobite trackways moved higher and higher through rock layers. However, he found more curious burrows eventually by the thousands. Further up, instead of finding burrows, he found complete tracks of the critters scurrying across the sediment. At first, he found only a handful of these tracks but he found much more the higher he went. Suddenly, out of nowhere, he came across a mass graveyard of billions of trilobite shells. It was incredible. Kurt explained that scientists have found the same sequence all over the world. Burrows in one layer, trackways in layers above, and then the actual body of the fossil in the layer above the two. It's a curious pattern that is puzzling to anyone who thinks that the Earth is very old. Kurt provides a simple explanation by saying, as layer upon layer of mud swept over the trilobites, they struggled to dig out of their new tomb. As they ran across layer, they had just covered them and made new tracks. But as each consecutive layer piled on top of them, they eventually collapsed in exhaustion and died by the billions. Kurt's research is an excellent example of how creation science can look at the data that has been reported and provided worldwide and give a better explanation than the rescuing devices that evolutionists give. Yeah, so talk about the the basement layer rocks, uh, Matt. You've talked many times about this, but there are several uh, uh, fossilized footprints in the basement rock when there shouldn't be anything at all, especially in the Grand Canyon. Um, we see uh, bear fo uh, bear tracks. We see horse tracks. Uh, uh, I, do we find uh, lizard tracks or bird tracks at all? Uh, yeah, we even find like salamander. <laughs> so we find things that aren't even supposed to have lived at all recently. Matter of fact, right. if you think about like when the evolutionary chart says that horses evolved, that was 55 million years ago, right? But we find horse tracks in 300 million year old basement rock. That is absolutely insane. You talk about a wrong prediction. And by the way, these are modern horse tracks. They think that a horse evolved from a little tiny marsupial 55 million years ago. We're not talking that a horse just appeared out of nowhere. Oh, no, this horse was super tiny, like the size of a dog. And then the horse slowly evolved into the larger horses that we see today. So even the 55 million year old horse tracks that they that they can assume like, oh, well, maybe maybe that horse walked over this area doesn't doesn't even add up because the horse print would be smaller than your little hand. You know, <laughs> it's totally falsified. And then a bear track. Bears weren't even supposed to exist either. 
bears are around the same time as horses, yet they're in 300 million year of basement rock. And the basement rock itself, there, there shouldn't even be any mammal life in basement rock, according to them. Right, so it's just a uh, huge, like, uh, out of place rocks in there, uh, fossils in the basement rock, and it's deadly for the evolutionary theory because how do you get those things down there? And uh, Charles Lyell uh, proposed, well, the and Native Americans did it. <laughs> the Native <laughs> Americans carved the carved the rock to make it look like a horse track. It's yeah, like, are they like a bear track? They just say uh, uh, some unknown, unidentified animal left them. Or, uh, that's a really good one, too. Just everything. Any rescue device they can make up on the spot sounds good. It's better than better than saying there was probably bears that existed that were older than we thought. Even that's more realistic, don't you think? Right, I mean, yeah. even that's and And it's so ridiculous, too, because when, uh, when Snake Was Right was debating someone, I forget, well, yeah, Snake Was Right was, uh, answering the question about the the phosphate beds in South Carolina, the actually phosphate beds. And that was like, me. <laughs> and he's that like, was me. He said <laughs> this. Ju- that that only proves that humans are older than we thought. <laughs> That's they can literally just say that. Uh, wait, wait a minute. That throws so, off everything. It's a rubber ruler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That just de- wait. You just falsified your own theory by saying that. Exactly. I mean, it's. Uh, I like to call it a rubber ruler because they can just change anything, whatever they want, without any scientific consent or without any peer review or anything. And they complain about us not having peer reviewed anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what we say by their theory not being falsifiable. It's not falsifiable because you can just change your mind at any minute right. and say anything. So how is that science? That doesn't even make any sense. They're wrong all the time. I love pointing it out because they, they flop on a particular subject or they fail on a prediction. Oh, well, we have more evidence now. It's like, no, you don't have more evidence. You were wrong. They can't even admit it. Yeah, it's like it's like when uh, Jackson Wheat debated Neff. He couldn't de- admit that he was wrong of, uh, about a statement that he said in his debate. Like, Neff was trying to tell him that wasn't evolution. That was, uh, 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 it's been a while since I, since I saw the video. It was, uh, phenotypic plasticity. Ah, uh, yes. And then Jackson Reed's like, what? Lizard. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. And then, yeah. and then after the debate, like a week later, he makes a video that's like, saying, this was due to phenotypic plasticity and not evolution. I'm trying to do my best Jackson Wheat voice. <laughs> right. Yeah, he, they got busted on that one because the Italian wall lizard was found to actually just have a, a muscle that develops when it starts eating vegetables again that it already had. It's a pre-existing element that when they eat insects, they don't need anymore, so it becomes worthless, and the muscle goes atrophied and disappears. But when they start eating plants again, the muscle comes back, so it was based on their diet. So they, they flopped big time on that one, yeah. I, Erica wanted to debate me on it because she said the same thing. She used it as evidence for evolution, and then when she debated me, she read through our book and realized, uh-oh, that actually has function. I better not use that argument. So she, she came out <laughs> she came out and admitted, okay, uh, the, the mainland ones have it as well. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, yeah. And, and this has been a rabbit trail. So we we're supposed to be talking about geology, and the, but I think it was necessary <laughs> talking about this. Uh, That's what happens when you go live, man. This is, this is the way it flows. It's all right. It's life. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, uh, brother, uh, talk about the uh, you. You had a big flop today. Uh, you were you were gonna interview uh, doc. Uh, does he have a PhD by any chance or anything? Uh, Mark Ar- uh, uh, Armitage. Yeah, I, I, he has a he has a master's degree. Okay. He's a microscopist. Okay. So yeah, he's so, got the degrees and he's published his work uh, multiple times with secular scientists, by the way. It's just the people that really don't like creationism that are against him because the other scientists that work with him, they believe in evolution and they don't have a problem with him at all. It was basically the place that he worked for, the, the institution that didn't like him and people online that don't like him. Because uh, there's the Mary Schweitzer and the other evolutionists today, they, they don't care. They don't care at all that he's a young earth creationist. Like it doesn't bother them. Matter of fact, they've even teamed up recently and they're releasing another peer reviewed study right now. So Mary Schweitzer and Mark Armitage. Yep. What? Right now. 
Yeah, it's great news, man. It's incredible stuff. So yeah, I flopped big time. I invited him on. <laughs> I invited him on. I, I practiced all night trying to figure out how to get a live stream going. And uh, I called him up and he said, uh, I, my computer is not compatible. We're going to have to do it over Skype. So I had no problem. I, I pulled out Skype and I started recording with iMovie and there was no audio. So I recorded nothing but the guy's face for over an hour. So yeah. bravo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not what I wanted to talk about, but you talked about it, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Mark Armitage, he found a, a Triceratops horn, brow horn, and uh, many atheists have tried to claim that it was a bison horn, which has no scientific evidence. Nobody's proposing that except the atheist keyboard warriors and uh, maybe Erica and Aaron Ra, but... Other than those people, uh, there's nobody actually claiming that it's a bison horn. So I don't know where they're getting it from, from their own imagination, of course. But uh, Mark Armitage found a, a brow horn that contains soft tissue in it. But uh, Dr. Kevin Anderson at the Cre Creation Research Society in uh, Arizona, uh, basically uh, he examined the brow horn and found out that there's still uh, proteins in the... In the uh, and the brow horn, which would have been near impossible to preserve for 65 million years. I'm running out of questions here. <laughs> uh, so I saw in your, uh, uh, just making sure I'm on uh, un unmute. <laughs> uh, uh, you, t you talked about uh, in your video about the flood. Uh, you, s you talked a lot about the fact that uh, the hail could explain frozen animals. Uh, so basically, you 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 mentioned in the video that there have been animals frozen in lakes, that that are a hundred percent frozen, like solid ice, like the whole river just frozen solid ice. Um, yeah. Are those fossilized specimens, or are they still today here with us right now? Or yeah, what, they actually there? found them still like messed up like um what happened is when they got frozen they became like a completely held in stasis and what happened is if they was going to thaw out we wouldn't have been able to find it because we would have they would have never done anything but the fossilization process allowed it to crystallize in its complete whole form even when the lake bed itself dried out so uh, not dried out but just became water again so obviously it didn't stay frozen until current times, but what they did is they actually found that they were frozen so quickly, they flash froze into petrification. That's how quickly they froze. They petrified instantly while alive. Well, so uh, I couldn't find a lot of information on it. Um, how did you find out about it? From an old book, okay. a really old book. <laughs> and, when, and when they find it? Uh, they found that one, who, uh, I believe in Russia, right? Okay, I was gonna say, it, it had to be really cold, like in Alaska or Russia or the Arctic or something, <laughs> the yeah. tundra. Well, they found, they found the bulls, the, uh, the oxen, that was found in China. That was where the study was done on that one. Right. Yeah. Right, so, uh, did it talk anything, I mean, you're saying it's an old book, so I'm pretty sure they didn't know what it, what this was, but did they find, like, could could they find like a genome in it? Or was DNA still preserved or something? I don't know. Uh, they probably could. There's no doubt that they could, but no one would ever consider to do it because it was just regular fish and right. regular oxen. But it was uh, so they did find it. They could have easily done the extraction because everything being completely frozen. But why would they have bothered? They just look like regular fish, right? It's like right. there was no reason to. Right. So yeah. The explanation for that would basically be, in the flood model, would basically be when the canopy of ice fell, it dropped like this huge balls of ice or hail, and they were yeah. dirty, and they actually held dirt in them, which was launched up, and it basically wrapped itself, the dirt wrapped itself when the fountains of the Great Deep broke open, and the dirt launched into the heavens, and it, 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 uh, it basically wrapped around it um, and fell down as hail. And uh, because when we look at freezing today, it doesn't it doesn't freeze like it doesn't solidly freeze a, a river or a stream, right? So it would just freeze the top of it. But if if you look at the specimens that you were talking about, it's solid ice. 
it's solid ice. I mean, it's it's not just a, a layer of ice over the water. It's just solid ice, which you barely see happen in today's world. The reason for that would be when the ice and hail fell into these rivers and lakes and uh, streams, they would go down to the bottom because they're heavy. And they would go down to the bottom, and as it froze on top, it would also freeze bottom up uh, because of the hail. Uh, so, uh, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, what was going on is anytime these balls of icy hail came back down and they went to the bottom of the water, it allowed not just the top to freeze because fish can swim underneath it just like they can in Antarctica today. It froze from the bottom up. So it was the two were meeting together. The top was getting cold and the bottom was getting cold. So it froze the lake at the same time together. So it, there was no way for the animals or the fish to escape. There was nowhere for them to go, not even in the middle. So, and that happened so fast and so instantly that there was no way for the oxen to even exit the lake. So that means that even though it was cold and they felt it was cold, they didn't, they didn't even think to themselves, we got to get out of here. It's getting too cold too quickly. Nope, they still got stuck and froze. And that's pretty incredible because these animals aren't exactly weak. I mean, to be swimming around in the right. a tundra. Bison. I mean, a whole herd of bison was frozen in, in its tracks. And woolly yeah. mammoths. I mean, you covered this in your video as well. It's not actually woolly mammoths. It's just a hairy mammoth with really long hair. It's one of those hippie guys. Um, <laughs> but woolly mammoths weren't made for the cold. If uh, They were just hairy. I mean, you... I mean, just because you have a lot of hair doesn't necessarily mean you, you, you're built for cold weather. I mean, you can finish your thought, though, and just move on. Oh, no, no, we can move on to it. Uh, yeah, think about it. Think of what animals live in the tropics today. We have the primates. We have um, the uh, sloth. Think about these things. They're covered in hair. Hair, for them, is actually very beneficial. It, it whisks away all the rain that hits their coat. You know, it's Ours is actually weak. <laughs> Our skin's very weak compared to what they've got. So, yeah, fur doesn't necessarily correlate with, oh, I'm, it's because I'm cold. No, that's the evolutionary theory. When you move up to the north, you should gain more body hair because it keeps you warmer. That's their theory, not ours. Right, right. And so, so we're talking about flood geology today. And uh, does it prove an old or young earth? And if you only had a minute to answer that question, Ramat, what, what, what would you explain in that one minute? Geology, does it prove it young or older? Sure. I would like to point everybody to a place called Pumapunku. And what it is, it's, it's in Bolivia, and it's 13,000 feet above sea level. And this place was hit by such a massive flood that it not only buried the temples that were there, it eradicated them. It ripped them into pieces. And some of these stones weighed as much as 131 metric tons. To give you an example of the amount of force and water that would need, it's just incredible to even think about. Now, what I want you to do is picture how could such amount of water be at 13,000 feet above sea level? rushing through there, not only knocking it down, but also submerging it underneath eight feet of mud. Because when they found these temples, they dug down eight feet and they found the tops of some of them. So not only did it rip most of them, the majority of them into pieces, it buried the others in, in mud so quickly that it didn't actually break them because some of them were buried directly in mud and then submerged eight feet deep under more mud. That is incredible if you actually try to think about that. And what their rescuing device would even be from this is from their little local lake that may have overflowed. Give me a break. That is absolutely insane to think that you're going to move those big of stones with a local flood. The only lake that's even near that place. I mean, that it still does flood sometimes and it doesn't do any damage, especially to those places. So that's a really good piece of evidence. And another one is one of my favorites. It's one of the Ashley Foster. Your minute is up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I'm making it up. It's all, I'm making it up as we go. 
And the next one is the Ashley Phosphate Beds of South Carolina. There is no bigger, better graveyard in Earth. It's You can basically look in that thing and find anything that you're looking for. And it goes from 200 square miles to 30 square miles. And the fascinating thing is it is you find ancient animals mixed with current animals, and it's in one layer. Yes, there's two layers, but one sand, and then there's the phosphate level. Now, that phosphate level is where everything is mixed up together. So you have local current animals from like sheep and wolves and sloths to giant megalodons and hadrosaurus dinosaurs and humans you get it all mixed together so when they come along and they say oh there's never anything out of place direct them there just that's all you have to do direct them to the ashley phosphate bed right and so you probably heard of this response to like the out of place fossils and all this other stuff like the ashley phosphate bed that you were bringing up just now uh they would basically say the evolutionists and uniformitarianists, of course, they would obviously say, "Well, when the when plate tectonics occurs, it just shuffles these layers together, and so when one layer goes down into the mantle, it just brings them up back into another layer, uh, which is totally out of place." And you know, they said that about Isophira isotolum when it was found in 1980. And uh, they said, well, it only got there because a rock uh, just, like, it, through plate tectonics just stuck itself to a, another rock layer, and that's how it got there. And uh, I think that's just a rescuing device that just needs to be pointed out. You, have you heard of that re uh, response, brother? Oh, of course, of course. But the, the problem with that theory comes down to the fact that even the phosphate itself is made of the very bones itself. And what they do is they go there and they grind up the phosphate and they sell it for fertilizer because it's so good. So they're grinding up all of the sea life mixed with land life at the same time. So why is there massive amounts of land life with sea life? That doesn't make any sense unless there's a flood, right? Who, what's gonna push a whale and a megalodon shark on top of sheep and goats, right? That's a right, flood. Right. I mean, and then when you look through these layers, you can find dinosaurs stomping through millions of years of these geological strata. That completely eradicates these layers as being millions of years or eons of time. That's it. It's over. Right. I want to carry on what you were just saying at the end of there, uh, at the end of your thought there, but uh, you brought up the sauropod, huge sauropod footprints that they find, and just going through multiple strata. And whether you like it or not, they're they're real, and you can actually look them up right now. I'm pretty sure they have them at the net, um, uh, the Natural History Museum over in London. I think that's where they are, but they're huge, basically, rocks. They're basically huge rocks, and they're about six feet tall. So the sauropod must have been pressing like through very soft uh, uh, so soft mud and uh, uh, sediments for that to happen, to for its, for its foot to go down six feet deep. <clears throat> and they found several, uh, just one rock, they found several different animals, including ten dinosaurs. Uh, they found a crocodile. Uh, six turtles and uh, several other smaller animals. They found, uh, I think they found about fifteen or uh, uh, ten or fifteen of them in just one rock, and uh, that, that's amazing if you if you actually think about it. That's uh, that's amazing evidence for uh, for the flood, and I'm pretty sure you covered that in your video. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. I, I, have you heard of it? Uh, yeah, I've tr I try to cover pretty much everything. I want to be really like detailed. I tr if I can't put it in a video, I'll just put it in the book uh, because sometimes there's just too much. You know, I try to make videos entertaining, but when you get really technical, yeah, kind of make people a little tired. You know, it's, there's only so much you can retain. <laughs> right, right. And that's why I don't really like to do – I don't really like to cover really technical stuff on this channel because – then the views go like way down. I, I just don't have an audience for that, and that's why I created a new channel just to reach an audience like that. But we'll, we'll try to get as technical as we can get on this channel. Um, All right. Is there, uh, what else should we cover, brother? We can go for as long as, uh, as, long as the day is long, but I'm, uh, there's a lot more to cover. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Um, next time, uh, we can talk about why is there ocean aquatic life in places where there shouldn't be. Like, for example, what is Titicaca. it? Yeah, like Titicaca is a great one. Aquatic life at 12,000 feet, right? They had to say that it was scooped up and slowly lifted by plate tectonics. Well, the problem with that one is salinization, right? It, it, you slowly lose salt from fresh water raining into it. Well, if that was true, 
then over the amount of the 10 million years or whatever that this took, <laughs> I mean, there should be not a so attention time is actually, a, I believe, like 4,000 years. Very, very low. And you can follow and you can track and you can do the math and it doesn't equate at all to what they have. So that would be a fun one to talk on. We have uh, volcanic layers, you know, ash. Ooh, that's a good one. Where's all the water? Where did the water go? That's always a popular question people always have. Cover that so, really quickly because I know some people are going to be watching this and they're going to be like, well, where did the water go? It's like, yeah. Have you not just, seen the several debates for Standing for Truth, Raw Mad, and Bill uh, Bill Morgan co cover that question? It's like, right. Like, well, you know, everybody looks around and they go, there's not enough water that's there to cover the mountains. There, The mountains weren't there. That's what we keep telling people. These mountains were formed at the end of the flood. The Bible even says that. The Bible specifically says at the end of the flood is when the mountains were formed. So how big were these mountains? Well, there was no Mount Everest to cover. So first of all, when the continents did break apart and they slipped and they fell down into the ocean, that raised the water up and it lowered the continents. So then it broke them apart. So now you have these massive tidal waves coming inland, ripping over the land. And then you have the, the land mass is lower and the mountains weren't even as high. So that solves that problem because when you look out at the ocean, you see where the water went. When you look at the icebergs, you see where the water went. We know that there's water underneath the oceans even today because underwater vents are still pushing fresh water into our oceans. You can see it today around the world. So it's no mystery that there's still water under the crust of the earth because it's still even coming up. But we also see exactly what our model said is that this fresh water is what broke out during the fountains of the great deep. Well, the fact is, is that happened during the flood. So, Right. And I have a, actually a question that I forgot to ask you. Uh, when the when Noah's flood came around, do you think it actually created a new sea level? Would that uh, somehow explain the base level question? Oh, yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, if you think about it today, our ocean level is even still rising even today. And if you look at really old maps, you can see the maps themselves uh, will show islands that are today submerged under the ocean. So we know that the ocean levels are rising. Matter of fact, you can even find temples today that were on the beaches and the shores of, of different continents that have now been completely submerged. And we know nobody's going to build a tower that's that's underwater. That's completely illogical. There's places in China where there's an entire megalithic structure that's right off the coast. But when they built it, it wasn't underwater. It's obvious. So what happened is the ocean levels rose and then boom, now, they're, now their megalithic structure is now gone. So that's what happened. So we're seeing, we're seeing temp, uh, regulation of water even changing today. Well, it's been a fun one, brother. you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, not that I can think of, man. All right, well, I appreciate you coming on, brother. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for watching. God bless you, and see you next time. The ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat on the seventh month of the 17th day of the month, and we now have evidence for this as well. We have discovered two amazing things. At the base of Mount Ararat, they discovered many drog stones. These gigantic stones are strewn about as though they were cut from the ship as the water receded. They are almost in a straight line pattern over eight miles approaching the mountains. What these are for is counterbalance for a ship during huge waves. When they discovered these, they wanted to actually put this to the test and see that if a ship which weighed as much and was shaped like the Ark, would it withstand massive tidal waves? The results showed perfect results that line up exactly with what we would expect if Noah's Ark was true. As the ship would roll and pitch, this would swing back and forth and up a little bit as the ship would pitch and roll, similar to a shock absorber in your car. And it's, it's slowing down that momentum that would be created from that. 
So quite amazing that uh, Noah's Ark would use that kind of technology. The next amazing find is they found the cover that Noah placed over the Ark. As far as we know, there's nothing else like this anywhere. Nobody's ever... My goodness. It's got crosses uh, that crosses? are very faintly carved on it. You got, a big, you got a big one here. You got a small one right there. Mm. One here. You ever see, it looks like a little bit like pine bark. It sounds like metal. <laughs> this isn't an anchor stone. Oh, I see. At one point it says, and uh, uh, Noah came out of the ark and he took the cover off, or he yeah. threw the cover off. This is a rather unique thing. It has the appearance and the texture of some kind of a bark. That is a cross. That is a cross. There you go. That is incredible. It has a very hollow sound. Very hollow. It sounds like metal. In 2014, a group of master students at Lesta University decided to settle the question. They used the biblical measurements to calculate the size of the ark, then they used the density of the water to figure buoyancy, and from there, determined how much weight the ship could endure before sinking. Their conclusion? Noah could have put 70,000 animals on board and the ship would have floated. And what do you know? It floats! 